I won't be before you long. In just a few minutes, my um, husband had said that um, for me to just take a few moments to uh, talk about praise and worship. Uh-huh, take my time. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not long-winded, y'all. <laughs> um, just a few things I, I wanted to just share, I mean, um, in regards to praise and worship. Uh, and I believe the praise and worship teams are here. Um, and also, many of you are leaders as well. Um, because there are some things that you need to understand, even when it comes to worship and praise as a general leadership body. Okay? Praise and worship is a lifestyle. It's not just about the praise and worship team. It's a lifestyle. Okay? Hallelujah. And that means that from day to day, even as leaders, leaders lead by example. If you don't know it, it's not do as I say and, and getting behind people and pushing. It is leading by example, meaning that I be the example and I lead and I look behind me and you're following. Amen. And as it is, it goes that way as well. When, when the praise and worship team gets up, before you get up on the podium praise and worship team, and even leaders, because actually this applies to all of you, um, before you get here, even to the service on Sundays or any day, you are supposed to be, ministry starts at home. Praise and worship starts at home. Hallelujah. Because we are not to be coming and trying to pump people up or even pump ourselves up when we get to the services. We are supposed to be preparing at home. That means spending time with God at home. You know, spending time in prayer, spending time talking to the Lord, dedicating, um, worshiping. If you are a worshiper, if you love to praise, then you should be singing at home, talking to the Lord at home. Amen. Making sure that you have relationship with God that starts at home. So then when you come to the church, it is an extension. It's already in you. It's already built in you. You're already full and overflowing. Amen. And ready to minister to the people in whatever capacity that you are serving. Because even praise and worship team, you guys are also leaders. You are leaders. Hallelujah. And people will follow your example. Amen. So it is important that you live a life that's pleasing to God. That means that you have to be... Um, you have to be prayed up. You have to have an attitude of gratitude. And then those who are on the team, you should love God and you should love what you do. And you should come to church with a good attitude. And then not coming and being, you're full of contention and divisions and strives. If you're fighting with each other on the praise and worship teams, that's not going to work. Even among leaders, if you're fighting with each other as leaders, that's not going to work. God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to give you a lot of scripture because I know my husband's going to walk scripture for you. But you're leaders as well. You're not babies. None of you are babies. Amen. You know the word. And we know that God is not the author of confusion. Thank you, Father. As far as the team, let me go there. The purpose of the praise and worship team, literally, is to set the atmosphere for the word. You're trying, you know, that's a purpose. Because many times when you come in um, with the different people that come in, you have different spirits that come in, okay? And that's a given because the church is a hospital. That's what we are. We are a hospital. And sometimes leaders get bent all out of shape. We got this. We've got this coming on. That They're doing this. They're doing that. You know, you're talking about the people, but you got to understand that this is what we're here for. It's they are sick, they're coming in with different types of conditions. Some need a Band-Aid. Some need surgery. Some need, you know, they, some of them need to just to be to, to bruises. Or you have to deal with the bruising. But whatever they're dealing with. Some have diseases. They're terminal care. You got to put them in ICU. Hallelujah. And then there's some that are dying and we got to literally rescue their lives. It's an emergency. A 911 that we have to deal with it and deal with it quick. Hallelujah. So we are a hospital. And we've got to be equipped to deal with whatever comes in. And many times, as they first come in, we haven't even gotten to get to the word yet. So many times these spirits are subdued through the pay, praise and worship. Hallelujah. we got to learn to set the atmosphere. It's not just singing selections. 
And we've got to understand that. Many times people don't understand it. They get up there, we'll sing two or three selections, and then we sit down and we've done our job. No, no, you haven't. When you're on the praise and worship team, you, you have to have a prayer life. And you have to be sensitive to the spirit of God. That's key, sensitivity. Because many times you may have three songs, four songs that you have practiced at rehearsal to sing. And you get here and God says, uh-uh, change that. And you got to be flexible enough that if God says no, though you rehearse these, you don't learn two new songs and you get bent out of shape because... I thought we were going to sing them songs. Are we not singing them songs? That's just a messed up my day. Excuse me? No. It is about being flexible. Why? Because what we are doing, we're doing for God. It's not to be seen. It's not for attention. And this is not a performance. It's not a stage of performance. Amen. So even when we're up there, it's not about because I've seen teams get up there and they're fighting with each other over the mic. And understand, people can see. You're up front, they see and they discern what's going on very clearly, and they don't have to have the Holy Spirit to do it. They can see you wrestling with the mics and, and jumping in and out of each other trying to take over the lead. They can see that. You know, if you're up there doing praise and worship and you're not even worshiping the Lord yourself, but yet you're leading praise and worship, no, because you're supposed to be inspiring the others. They are supposed to follow your lead. And as a, on the team, we are supposed to be standing there. You really are supposed to go before God for yourself as you, though you're a team. As a team corporately, all of you should have the same mind, the same spirit, the same sound going into the presence of the Lord. And as you go, then the people will follow. And if they never go, you make sure you go. Because if you go up into the presence of the Lord, then you reach him and you tap into his presence, you'll turn around and look and everybody's with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to learn that. And that's the same thing with leadership as well. You want people to follow your lead. You have to be one who is being an example that they can follow. Not just telling people to do things and you don't do it yourself. Your leaders, your service, people should see you worshiping as well. Prayer nights, nobody should have to tell a leader to come to prayer. And, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm meddling. I'm meddling, sir. <laughs> I'm meddling. Hallelujah. Um, but I have to say that because I have pastored as well. And I'm going to tell you, you can't be a good pastor or a minister. You can't be a good leader if pastor has to fuss at you about coming to the weekly services. You are leaders. You're not babies. So you should be first and foremost prime examples. If you have a post, you should be on your post. Nobody should tell you or even come to you and say, where were you? Why weren't you here? Nobody should have to say that to you. And if they have to keep saying that to you, then maybe you don't need to be a leader. Hallelujah. I'm real, y'all. I'm honest, y'all. Hallelujah, because we're walk talking about doing things for God. This is the kingdom of God. And come on now, God deserves better than that. He deserves our best. Hallelujah. We go to work and we'll give the job our best. But they didn't die for us. What did they give us? Many times they don't even want to give us a paycheck that they give us. But we'll give them our best. They'll take advantage of us. They use and abuse us. And yet still we'll give them our best. And then we come to God and give God half service, half hazard service. He deserves better than that. He keeps you alive every morning. He feeds you. He clothes you. When you're sick, he heals you. When you need deliverance, he delivers you. He makes ways out of no way. And yet you want to give him half her hearted service and think it's okay. It's not okay. God requires more from us. And he loves us so much he could cut us off because we're not doing it. But he continues to give us time to get it right. You are leaders. Leaders lead and you lead by example. You ought to strive to be the best leader that you can be. The best leader that you can be. You don't have to be like each other. Don't try to, to act like anybody else. You don't have to be like pastor. You're not a clone of pastor or of sister um, Navarrete. You don't have to be clones of them, but you can be the best you that God has created. Each one of you have gifts and talents that God has given you. And some of you even have the nerve to sit on and hide some of the talents that you've got, knowing that God gave them to you for the kingdom to be used even in this ministry. And you want to pick and choose and decide which ones you want to use. 
Mm. If I step on your corn, just say ouch. <laughs> Hallelujah. Truly, it is about being an example. The other thing is, even while you're leading, whether you're leading from your different posts here or even leading during the praise and worship, you got to understand that before you step through those doors, I used to tell people, you know, as God is, as you're coming to church and you get to the park a lot, he said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. When you get out that car, you should start thanking him. Attitude of gratitude, thanking him. Because many times before that, some of you haven't even taken the time to thank him through that day, the day before, the day before that, because you've been so busy. You got so many things. And, and I understand because many times we can get very busy, but we cannot forget who we are and what our purpose is. God created us to worship him. He created us to please him. He, we, our very existence is not to do the work, though that's part of it. But the work is not going to save you. Even though you do everything that you do in the ministry and you do that well, if you don't have a heart that's right before God, if you're not living right, but yet you're doing the work, that's not going to save you. Because you go before God and, and you say, I cast out devils in your name. Didn't I do all these wonderful things? And he say, yes, he did. He don't tell you you didn't do them. He said, oh, you did them. But depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship you weren't serving me. You were serving the building. You were serving the idea of church, but you weren't serving me. Hallelujah. That some of us get caught up with the work, with the work, the work. And we think that it's about the work. It's about the work. And we don't really take the time to get into God and really develop relationship with God. That's what all of this is about. Getting to know him. You can't please him if you don't know him. So as you are coming, you should be entering into his gates with thanksgiving. From the parking lot to that lobby door, you should be thanking him. By the time you hit the lobby, then you can enter into his courts with praises. You can start your praises in the lobby right there or as you're coming in, but you need to start them with praises. So that way you begin to prepare your heart and your spirit for being in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Get your mind right. Get it focused and get it ready. You got to begin to shake off the things of the week because many times you've gone through things. The enemy has fought you all week long. You've got depression, suppressions. You shouldn't have depressions, but many times, sometimes you do. Hallelujah. And you've got to shake all that stuff off and begin to prepare yourself to come into the presence of the Lord and to be used by him. There are times that you have arts with each other and issues with you. Many times people are not getting this stuff straight before they walk up into the presence of the Lord. I've seen praise teams where they have, they're mad at each other. This one did this in rehearsal. That one did that in rehearsal. And you're upset with each other. And you don't understand that the holy, that pulpit here is a holy place. It's a holy place. A holy place. Even when you step into here, you're standing on holy ground. So how is it that you think you can just walk up there, you got issues with each other, you're halfway looking at each other or won't speak to each other, and then you want to get up there and lead people into the presence of the Lord? Not so. If you have all, you're supposed to leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled. Go be reconciled. Get it right. And then once you do that, make sure your heart, God, ask God, even before you hit the pulpit, God created me a clean heart. Renew it right. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. You need to ask God to search you every single day. Hallelujah. Every day. And as he searches you. He will make known unto you if there are infractions or if there's anything that's not like him. That's what we want. We want to have a clean heart as we walk up into his presence. So as you're there and you're singing in the presence of the Lord, let nothing be in your heart. Make sure your heart is clear and your mind is clear because then that frees you up for being able to hear God clearly and distinctly. Praise and worship team, you all ought to be praying with each other. Um, not just even though you have a little prayer before you start your rehearsals, a lot of times it'll be like five minutes and then you go straight into your praise and worship. Honestly, for a praise and worship team, I mean, I would always say that before you can start the praise and worship rehearsal, everybody needs to tap into God and you don't move until they do. That's in the rehearsal. You need to tap into him until you reach him and begin to speak in tongues and let everybody be refreshed before you go into the rehearsal. 
And then as you walk into the rehearsal, you'll have rehearsals where you're up there praising and worshiping and you're practicing and it'll turn into a church service because the presence of the Lord will walk in. So that's what you want. That's what prepares you for service to the Lord. Hallelujah. And each membership team member auxiliary, you need to do it as well. When you're having your team meetings, you don't need to just come and say a five minute prayer. Lord, bless the meeting, bless this, bless that. Y'all need to tap in, grab hands and tap into the presence of the Lord because you're preparing for service of God. And as you walk in, if everyone is plugged into God, refreshed and overflowing with the Holy Spirit, then there's nothing that they can walk through those doors that can have any major effect. Demonic spirits can't have any rule, can't even move. You can lock them down in the spirit where they can't even function once they step through those doors. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And I can talk it because I've seen it done and have orchestrated it being done. Ushers should be those who are greeters, ushers. You should be able to, to discern spirits as they walk up through the door. And as you shake hands, you're smiling and saying, praise the Lord. You, but if you're really praying and discerning like you should, you shake the hand, you feel the spirit. Uh-huh. And in yourself, in, you, in your spirit, you say, mm-hmm, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Have a seat. Have a seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You will be subject to the anointing in this house. Hallelujah. 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 And it happens and it can happen if you will stand in the position where you need to be in the Lord. Amen. And it's all about loving God. If you love God, he'll talk to you. If you talk to him, he'll talk to you. And you, nobody has to be vicious because it's not about being vicious, being a soldier. It's not about that. That's not God. God operates in love. And that's the other thing. When you're dealing with each other or dealing with God's people, whether problem, issue, or whatever, it's got to be in love. Praise and worship team, in love. Deal with each other, in love. Even as you're dealing with the congregation, you're setting the atmosphere for the presence of the Lord. You have to be sensitive. Sometimes you'll get up and you're getting ready to walk into praise and worship, and then you're feeling the atmosphere and, and okay, and the Lord will let you know what needs to be done. Sometimes you have to do another prayer if pastor will allow that. But you need to just hear God. Or sometimes, it, you know, if it's just songs that pastor has you do, you obey your leader. Obedience is key. And I'm not here to change how pastor does things. Amen. That's not what we do. We work together. So it is you obey your leader. If you get new ideas, things you want to do, you must talk to your leader first and get his okay. Because he's the visionary. Amen. And God gives him things for specifically for this house. I'm just sharing. Because these are things that I have actually walked with other leaders as well, and they're proven. So I'm just sharing, and pastor can weed and take however, whatever he wants. Amen. But, um, you know, everything in God, he said, do all things in decent and in order. And I'm very much a believer, and I live order. Amen. As leaders, we can't talk things and try to teach things, and we're not living them ourselves. Because you're not effective. You won't be effective. Nobody's going to hear you if you're not practicing what you preach. And that's something that we have to get. Amen. It's one thing to teach the word, to know the word here, but it's another to live it. And that's what God is calling us to do, is to live. Word made flesh. Live it. Live it. It's got to become alive in you and become a part of your everyday life. And when it is, then pastor won't have to hear some of you saying, but pastor, it's so hard. It's hard. It's hard to do what's right. It's hard to live for the Lord. It's hard. No, the way of the transgressor is hard. Hallelujah. The way of the transgressor is hard. But if you're living for God and staying in his presence, not saying you're going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. That's key. You're going to make mistakes. And even on your teams, your leaders, you don't drive your people like a slave driver either. Amen, because some can be really hard on folk. You want people to be easy on you. You want pastor to be easy on you, but then you want to get with the people and slave drive them and, and have no passion, you know, no compassion, rather. You just drive them and beat them and crack the whip. You know, that's not God. That's power hungry. That shows that you don't know how to handle authority. You're not mature enough, and maybe you don't need to be in that position. <sighs> Hallelujah. Because with maturity comes wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. 
you got to be compassionate. God is love. And if you are a child of God and you are ascribing, you are focusing on and purposing yourself to walk as he walks, then you're going to act like your dad. You're going to act like him. So if people who come in, even visitors, many times we offend them very quickly. And it shouldn't be. Because the love of God should show forth in you. If they are ugly, what did the Lord tell us? Even to your enemies, we are supposed to be good. Bless and cur- bless not curse. Bless your enemies and do good. So even if they come in and we c- consider them an enemy, you're still supposed to be good to them. Not give them attitude. If they be nasty, you don't be nasty back. Because they're coming in here many times, they'll do it just to test you to see how you react because first impressions are lasting impressions. So you have to make sure that you are exhibiting God because you servants you are who your members are yielded to obey. So if your mouth, your lips, your eyes, your body language, your hands are yielding those things of the devil, then who's your dad? Hallelujah. And they will tell you in a minute, that's not God. They tell you. So it is key. Praise and worship team, you're not just holy while you stand in the pulpit. You're not just in the presence of the Lord when you stand in the pulpit. Then you come down, and I've seen some fall asleep. Some get to walking after they come down out of praise and worship. They get busy. They walk in. They go out of service or sit near service not paying attention because it's not your time now. So now you're no longer engaged. You're not worshiping. You're not praising from your seat. You worship and praise here, but then you get back in your seat, and you're doing so many other things. You're not engaged. People watch. They watch. So you're not effective praise and worshiper if you can't praise and worship him just as much in your seat when you sit down or even before you get up there rather than when you get up there and it's my time to serve. And that goes for any other leader. Because if you want to get up there and tell everybody, oh, raise your hands, oh, shout, oh, sing, oh, you need to open your mouth. And then when you're sitting down in the pew and it's not your turn to be behind the pulpit, can't nobody get you to raise your hands. Can't nobody get you to open your mouth. You only want to do it. You only feel the spirit when you're behind the pulpit. That pulpit is not filled with the spirit. And this mic shouldn't turn you into spiritual sister or spiritual brother because you got the mic. You ought to be who you are, whether you're sitting down or standing up. Hallelujah. Praise and worship ministry is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. We have to live it with each other. Amen. I want to get a little bit more into the praise and worship because you all have to understand it as well. It has been, once again, we said being sensitive to the spirit and the presence of the Lord. Team being flexible. If God changes songs on you, you want to be flexible to hear him and to move according to what he is saying. I've had it where God has actually shifted it and we have had songs set and the Lord just totally shifted it and put another song. Then there were times when when the music was playing prophetically, sometimes God, the spirit of God will rest on the keyboarders and, and he'll begin to play. And as he's playing, you got to have an ear to hear and your spirit has to be in tuned to know that that's not a regular set of notes. That, that's not a regular set of music that doesn't go to any song that's prophetic. And when you hear it, you key into it then you've got to be in tune. Okay, God, what are you saying? And so then that's when you need, the whole team should be. We have written songs standing in praise and worship. Worshiping, we're supposed to be in praise and worship, singing songs, and all of a sudden God shifts everything, and all of a sudden the music is playing, and God just has us begin one at a time just to sing, and sing words, and we have written songs. I can't even remember half of them, but God just does it. God, and in the midst of that, at the end of the service, I've had people come up and say, oh, my God, while you were singing, there was something I was going through. I had one lady said, I was getting ready. I was going to plan to leave here and go commit suicide. The songs that we had lined up for that day, because we do line them up, you know, just because God says does this, but we're always open because we know he going to shift it if he does, and we want him to. Why? Because this service is about him. It's not about our programs. It's not about our time schedules. And I'm not messing with your time schedule, sir. (laughs) But in all honesty, it isn't. If we want the presence of God, it's not about him being on our program and on our time schedule. It's It's about us hearing him and moving according to what he says. If we want him in our services, we have to allow him and really allow him because he's not going to transgress us. We have to allow him to rule. We call him our Lord and our Savior, but we don't let him rule. We say, okay, Lord, you got 10 minutes to work. 
You got 15 minutes, Lord. Well, we only doing two selections, so you got to do what you do with two selections. Maybe he doesn't want that. But once again, you're still subject to pastor. Because if pastor says no, then you just have to say, okay, Father, you already know. Amen. But if there's a flow and you look at pastor and say, we need a few more minutes. And I'm sure that he wouldn't, you know, go against that if the flow of the spirit is there. If the anointing is there, it's key to follow the anointing. And you've got to be sensitive because you don't know what God is doing in the atmosphere. And that's the key. Praise and worship your team. You guys are actually those who actually bulldoze even through the atmosphere. You don't know what you're breaking up. People have been saved, healed, delivered, and set free, Pastor, in a praise and worship session. Nobody laying hands on them. Laid out in the floor prostrate. We've had visitors laid out prostrate. Saints laid out prostrate and God operating on them. Nobody laid hands at all. God did it. People filled with the Holy Ghost. Nobody touched them. God did it. Because God had free flow and free course to do what he wanted to do. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want his presence. We want his glory. We ask for his glory, but then we don't give him rule. We don't give him space to do what he wants to do. And that's where we've got to line up to. And all we have to do is just be that willing vessel. That willing vessel. I hear some of you saying, well, I don't really have any gifts. And so I understand that God is using those, but, but he don't really use me that way. So I'm just a bystander. No, you're not. If you will line up and make yourself available to God, because that's all we are. Those of us who are servants, we are available. We make ourselves available to him. We are nothing but vessels, and he comes and he uses us. It is not about our power, not about our ability, not about our strength. It's by his spirit that we do what we do. And if he doesn't say anything, then we can't say anything. If he doesn't do anything, then we can't do anything. Hallelujah. We do nothing of ourselves, of our own mentality, of our own minds. It is all him. And that's what we have to seek after. Seek after hearing from him. Seek after hearing his mind. And yes, you hear him from different directions. You hear him from your pastor. You hear him from, you know, those that are leaders. And then you will hear even through prayer. God can speak through many different things, but you got to be sensitive. Sensitive. Musicians and praise and worship team, y'all have to make sure that you work together. And then those who are ministers, you have to be sensitive as well. Because sometimes during the praise and worship, when you're praising and worshiping in the midst of the service, if you go high enough, sometimes if you tap into the higher realms of worship and the spirit and the glory of God begins to come down, you'll see spirits start to act up. Many times they will start to cut up. So ministers have to be sensitive as well to see what's going on. And many times you don't have to touch either. You can pray. Or sometimes if they start getting a little rugged, we used to get up and walk right to the pew, to the end of the pew where they were. One minister be on one side, one be on the other. We don't even have to say anything to each other because you all are supposed to be so in tune to each other. One spirit, one mind, same spirit, same mind that you don't even have to speak to each other. Look at each other and already know what you're saying. Uh Uh-huh, we need to go right there. You get on that side, I get on that side. Stand at both ends of that pew and pray. And lock that thing down, subdue it, cast it out, whatever God is saying. Because the key is your power is in God, whatever he is saying. And you don't have to be any one major to do it. Just hear God and just obey him. And he will use you. You stand at the end of that, that pew and pray and see him sit down. And then you go on back and finish up. Service never has to be disrupted. Nobody really even has to know what just happened or what you did. But it will keep order in the household of faith. Amen. It's about letting God be God. Unity is key among leaders, among the praise and worship team, among the musicians, and everyone has to understand their place. Musicians don't lead. Musicians follow. They don't set the tone for the selections for where everything is going. They should follow whoever's leading the particular praise and worship. If they're separate leaders and you're leading, they should be following you. Musicians shouldn't be telling you, okay, you got to end the song now. That's not what musicians do. Musicians are followers. That's what they do. They only play in the music. And then those of you who are lead, you have to be in tune with each other and in tune with God. Don't get the mic and go buck crazy. And like, okay, I don't want to give it up to nobody else. This is my time. So I'm on my debut. 
you know, especially since you're live streaming, be careful. You don't want it to ever appear that you're in a performance or you're trying to show off. It's not about that. It's not about you. And when you do that, then the presence of the Lord kind of shifts and even becomes quiet because it's not him. That's not what you want. And if it is what you want, then you don't need to be on the team. Sorry. Hallelujah. And for those of you who may be wanting to be on the teams, understand that um, those, and I was talking to, I think, I don't know if I was talking to you or someone, another pastor, but in all honesty, praise and worship team can't be those who just desire to be on it. They really need to be chosen, need to be proven. We need to watch y'all in the pews while you're worshiping and we, and then allow pastor or even sister Navarrete or some of the others to, you know, ministers to look out and say, mm, pastor that, or pastor, God will tell them, you know, that's a praise and worshiper right there. Why? Because they demonstrated proven. You are proven. Leaders should be proven. Really and truly proven. Not about, oh, I think I want to be a leader. Oh, I think I want to know. Proven. Which means that you have to work out and exercise and be, do what you do in excellence and do it unto God. Watch your motives. If you start finding yourself saying, well, they just have me doing this, they have me, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, and complain, 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 but then come to church and smile and try to do that, God's not going to honor your service because you're not doing it unto him with joy. And that's the key. Whatever you do unto the Lord, you ought to do it unto him with joy and with love and with gratefulness and with appreciation, even that he wanted to use you because he don't have to. Out of the millions of people, he didn't even have to save you. There are people over in the other countries, there are people here in the U.S. here still now who don't know who Jesus is, who don't even know, haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. But God chose to save you and to put you in these heavenly places in him. You, you can't take that for granted. Don't take it for granted. And understand the positions that you have. God-given positions. And while God has given those to you, many times that's not even the end of who you're going to be. So you've got to just do your best and work at getting as close to God and allowing God to use you. Because many times those are stepping stones and training grounds for God to take you higher in him. And he moves you to other places as well and has you do other things. But you've got to be obedient. Obedient to God. Obedient to your leaders. Your leaders shouldn't have to fuss with you or you shouldn't fuss with them. And you shouldn't be arguing back and forth. Well, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I, I'm not understanding why you have me doing that. I don't see it that way. Well, you're not the visionary. You're not the leader. It doesn't matter if you see it that way or not. And if you don't see it that way, then you need to go back and pray and ask the Lord to help you to see it that way. Hallelujah. Because evidently you're listening to some other voices and those other voices are not God. Because if God is speaking, you should be hearing the same thing. And then if you're not, understand you're not at the level where your pastor is. So then you need to conform and submit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because obedience is key. Obey them that have the rule over you. As they must watch for your souls that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Why? Because that's unprofitable for you. It's not a good thing. You don't want to grieve the man and the woman of God. Not ever. And you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't even feel like you should have to. Amen? Amen. In the midst of the praise and worship, I'm going to say this, and I think I'm, I'm about finished because there's a whole lot of places I could have went, but um, just following the leading of the Lord um, and what he's saying. But ministers need to be as sensitive as well in the spirit, sensitive to transitions, because sometimes if the praise and worship team is off or if everyone is not in tuned, then the minister, which you guys are at a higher level than the praise and worship team, if pastor's not in here, you guys ought to be keeping order. You all ought to be able to feel the shifts. And if something shifts the wrong way, then you need to go, uh, okay, we need to go back to that. Because sometimes we'll start songs and we'll be singing songs and we know that we're beating a dead horse. You know that. You know when you're singing a song and that song is not God. It's not that it's not a good song, but all songs are not orchestrated for particular days. You know what I'm saying? Or particular services because God knows who's in the building. And the songs are meant to minister to the people, not just to sound good to the ears. 
they're, they're not just song selections. They are meant to do things in the atmosphere, amen, and to shift things and to minister to certain people. So you got to hear God because everything you'll find in a service, they many times everything works together and it's a building and it's all working to the word of God. Praise and worship sets the atmosphere for the word. It makes the atmosphere pliable and even opens up the ears so that the people will have an ear to hear when the word of God comes. That their hearts will be prepared. That their minds and their emotions will be prepared. And it is praise and worship. It is music that does that. Amen. Because if you, how many have been in a store? And music, some crazy music is playing, and you're not even thinking about it. You're saying, oh, that's so ungodly. Oh, it's so awful. And then you walk out the store, and you do something else, and you find yourself singing this crazy song. You're like, wait a minute, Jesus. What happened? The Lord was showing you the power of music. Even when people come in visiting, many times they won't stay for the word, and that's the other thing. People many times will come to services, and they will stay through everything, through the praise and worship, the offering song selections, and then when they feel like it's getting time for the word, they'll get up and get out. So it is the praise and worship, the songs many times that will grab a hold of them. Why? Because while you're singing, you are singing the word of God, and it is getting into the recesses of their heart, breaking up that stony heart, placing the word of God in there, even where they could fight it if you were talking to them, but the music seems to just open up doors and saturate them, and they can't fight it they just because they love the music, and the music just moves right on into their spirit. It's important. The worship is important. It does a whole lot more than you know. And so how we handle it and how we walk into it, it has to be governed by God. You have to be governed by God. In all walks of your leadership and your service to God, you need to be governed by God. And if you allow God to use you, if you walk it with sincerity, and if you live for God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your spirit, with all your soul, with all your body, if you give God everything, withholding nothing, hallelujah, withholding nothing, amen, then God can use you. And you will be a, an effective ministry. I see you as banding together as one giant team in the Lord. Leadership and all. Just being a strong leadership that God can move in. And it needs to be because this church is going to move and to go places. And as people begin to pour in the hundreds, pastor can't handle it all. He's going to have to entrust some of you to be his extended hands to help to move the ministry forward. And you have to be mature. You have to be trustworthy. Because even in this, God is testing many of you to see how much he can trust you with. And if he can't trust you, then you're gonna, you won't be promoted. You'll be demoted. But if God says, I, if I can trust you with this, then I'll give you a little bit more. And more is going to be needed. There's a lot of work that has to be done. But it has to be done with the leading and the direction of God. Amen. No fighting, no arguing. Attitudes have to be fixed. And everyone has to spend their time in the presence of the Lord. No big eyes and little U's. Even if you have a position over everyone, once again, watch how you treat each other and treat God's people. Watch your attitudes. If you find you got an attitude problem, you need to get down at the altar. Eat carpet if you need to. But you need to get down there. Talk to the Lord. Lay it out before him. Amen. And ask God, clean me up. Fix me. Fix me. Change me. Because in order to move forward, we've all got to have the right attitude. One mind, one spirit, and one sound. Got to. Unity. Because in unity, there is strength. And the enemy's going to try to divide. That's what he does. He divides and he conquers. So if he can get you tangled up in your position, feeling like my position is the most important, so I'm going to lock down the church everywhere I got control, I'm going to control it. And therefore, everybody has to do what I say. No, it's not about that. And you're out of order. You're out of line. We've got to work together in love and in unity. Love and unity. So from the musicians, the keyboards, the drummer, the drummer can't decide, I'm going to lead the songs today. And he starts just playing and drumming and drumming and drumming. And you can't hardly sing because the drummer's too loud and he's doing his own thing. It's not going to work. Keyboarders can't go buck wild because today is going to be my solo, my debut. Somebody's watching on, on um, the web and I'm auditioning for something else at some other church. And I'm going to play my thing. And, and believe me, people have done it. I've seen it all. 
church on live web, web stream, and, and they done interviewed with some other church behind their pastor's back to get some more pay. And so then they, all of a sudden, you're in church, ministers wonder, what's wrong with the keyboardist? All of a sudden, he's doing a solo in the middle of the song, just going flat buck wild. Found out later, he was auditioning on web for another church. How we do stuff like that? It's not God. It's not God. Whatever God has for you, understand, is for you. And God will, your gifts will make room for you, and God will open the doors. You be faithful to your ministry. Be faithful to where God has placed you. And be obedient to your leadership. There's one leader here. My old bishop used to teach us, even when I was a young girl growing up, he said, anything with more than one head is a monster. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the other thing said, anything with more than one head is a freak. But... <laughs> <laughs> so you got one head here and everyone else is extensions of that and if we want the body of Christ to truly grow this body here you guys are wonderful you're wonderful people and I'm sure y'all don't have any of that going on here hallelujah but you got to understand that as God grows he's grooming all of you to where you need to be if you feel like you're being overwhelmed that's a good indication that you need help some of you leaders may have a lot more because many times when ministries are growing and they start growing, they're growing quick. Many times different positions can be overwhelmed very quickly. And that happens. But what you need to do is be wise enough as a leader to say, I need some help. So you talk to pastor and say, I'm being overwhelmed. Not try to hold on to everything because now it makes me feel important. Now I feel like I got all this control. Woo, it's a high. But that's not what God wants. Because then you're going to, if you're trying to handle too many things, you're going to find that you're not effective. Because one person can't do 20 things at once. So you're running here, you're running there, you're doing this, doing that. And something is going to get dropped. You're going to drop the ball on quite a few things because you're trying to do too many things at once. A good leader understands that it's not working hard. It's working smart, effective. So a good leader will train people underneath them to help him do what he does. Why? Because this is even more important than working in corporate. They do that in corporate, you know, but this is even more important. This is the work of God and it must flow and it must flow smoothly without breaks and cuts because you got to stop here and do that. That affects the service when something is not allowed to flow smoothly, when there are breaks and there are hesitations and, and it just stops the flow. And God can't adequately flow like that because things are too broken up and they need to flow fluently and consistently and spontaneously. Just allow the God just to flow. So with that, train other people. It's not going to take away from your position. Actually, it'll enhance it and make it even stronger. Teach other people to do parts here, parts there, and all you got to do is supervise. Amen? And amen, that's for you too. <laughs> You know, majorly for you, because you have a lot of gifts. That's your son back there, isn't it? You got a lot of gifts, a lot of talents. But delegate more, okay? Supervise, train, because you're needed. There's a lot to do, but you got to delegate more. I saw you running back and forth, and I'm like, what is he doing? You, you, you're running from up there all the way down here, and then running up. I'm like, what, what is that? <laughs> so, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Get some help. Delegate. Talk to your dad. Delegate. Train and supervise because that's what builds the kingdom. And that's for the rest of you. It builds the kingdom effective. We want to be effective for God. That's key. Praise and worship team, y'all are the size you are now, but understand it may grow. But before it grows, you guys have to make sure that you are quality. It's not about quantity. It's not about having 500 voices, 25 voices. It isn't. It's about being quality, being the best that you can be. Your attitudes have to be together when you come. Absolutely. And husbands and spouses, y'all especially, <laughs> got to have it together. If things are not right at home, get them right. Because understand when things are not right and then you're getting up before God, it taints the worship. It taints the praise. It does. It affects it. And you're not offering up a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto God. You're not. And you will feel that in the midst of the worship and in the midst of the, the, the flow of God. You can feel it. It's not where it needs to be. 
I mean, y'all saw the example of what happened was the last night, even the last couple of nights. I have to say I've been here, and it has been wonderful, and, and y'all are doing well. But God wants to take you so much further, so much more he wants to do with you. Because, I mean, this God is just doing some awesome things here. And before the major flow of people start coming in, because they're coming in. They're coming in, y'all. They're coming in. They're coming in, y'all. They are coming in. And y'all have to get ready. And God is being gracious enough to give you a few minutes to get it ready and get it right. You, many of you, you got some things you got to tighten up, and you know you do. You got to tighten up. You got to come up on some things you know you do. So now don't just drag around and say, uh-uh, now's the time to take that time to go ahead and do it. Because when you get 600, 700, 1,000 strong, that's not the time to be trying to tighten up. God's trying to get you to do that now because many of you are going to be used to help as they come in. You're going to have to help. Help disciple. Help keep order. Help pray for people. Help minister to them. You're going to have to do that. But you've got to be in a position to be ready to do that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot to be done. A lot to be done. Um, Y'all, make sure your praise and worship team, when you guys come, not just stand up there and pray. You guys really should be walking around. Walk. Walk the congregation in your rehearsals. You know, as you're praying, just kind of walk and pray. Because whenever you're in here rehearsing, just want to saturate. I mean, every auxiliary, I'm sure pastor comes and prays. Or Sister um, Navarrete comes. I know there are different groups, women's group, men's groups, all of you. When you're here, walk the sanctuary and pray. Saturate it with prayer. Walk the lobby and pray. Saturate it with God's presence. Because that's what we want. We don't want the enemy to come in here and feel comfortable. And come up and sit on the front seat and cross his legs and feel comfortable. No, I remember the day when you couldn't get an unsafe person to come anywhere near front seat. They would come through the door, barely get through the door, and you'd offer them a seat further. And they'd be like, no, we'll sit on the back seat. Because they didn't want to get nowhere near the fire. And they could feel it when they stepped through the door. They were like, uh-uh. And they would stay toward the back. Now, they'll come in and sit on the front seat and cross their legs. That shouldn't be. And some of us are not on our posts. Even as leaders, you're not on your posts. you got to understand the strength of it. And I'm about finished. Um, you've got to understand the strength of who you are and whose you are. Amen. Um, and I don't know who your ushers and things are, but I was, there was something I made mention to it, and I, I'm just you know, kind of taking a little liberty here. But um, even with the different visitors that you have come in, I'm going to say this because I'm not one that gets into people's standards. I don't do that. But I, I've made an observation, and I'll just say this. If anyone comes in, now we're not telling people what to wear. That's fine. We don't need to. But if you notice that they come in and they're sitting on the front seats and their skirts are too short, they shouldn't be on the front seat. And if you're a minister and you come in or a leader and you come in and you sit on the front seat and your skirt's too short, you shouldn't be on the front seat. That's it. You shouldn't be. Um, and you know that. You know, so no, we're not telling you what to wear, but you need to be conscious. You see, you have a mirror at home. You have a mirror at home. If you don't have one, you need to have one. And it should be a full length, not just the one to see your head. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it needs to be a full length. Hallelujah. And you don't need to just look at the front of you. You need to look at the side of you, and you need to look at the back of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, because we don't want to offend anybody. And that's what it's about. It's about being offensive. You know, we don't, some of us have wonderful shapes, and some of us don't. But even at that, it doesn't matter if it's wonderful to anyone else. It can still be wonderful to us and to our husbands or whomever. And, but the thing is, the key is, it can't be to come and show off your shape. So if your clothes are too tight, don't do it. Stand in that mirror and look. We used to teach people, stand in the mirror, bend over, look at yourself. If you see panty lines, if you look like you squeezed a small city, I mean a, a big city into a small city, don't do it. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you see donut rolls, don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. You know, we don't need to see bra lines. We don't need to see cleavages. The puppies don't need to be ready to jump out at the visitors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Subdue the puppies. Hallelujah. It's just a truth anyhow. 
You don't have to wear a turtleneck. No, I'm not saying that. But there are things that we used to teach people that when you're in your house, in that full-length mirror, which is very, very helpful and instrumental, while you're standing in front of that mirror, you need to bend down and look at yourself. If you're bent over and people could see your cleavage, your shirt's too low. It's too low. And we can't be offending people, especially leaders. You can't be offending people, and people expect that leaders should know better. Praise and worship team, y'all are it. Y'all got to. You got, because you're up there. You don't know what God have you. I have kicked off my shoes. Sometimes God has had me prostrate on the pulpit. If my dress was too short, I wouldn't have been able to do it. If my shirt was wrong and I rolled back over like this, everything would have been showing. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to be prepared for service. You can be beautiful and not be dressed out of line. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And bigger is better. Sometimes we feel like, well, we wear things that are fit and make us look cute. No, baby, it doesn't. It don't. Everybody don't want to see your donut rolls. Your love handles. Pork chops, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Everybody don't want to see that. <laughs> and that's not cute. That's not beautiful. You know what I'm saying? It's not. And I understand sometimes our bodies can shift and go through changes. And sometimes it can be just be that, you know, your body shifts and your, your money hasn't caught up to help you get the wardrobe. I can understand that. But in those cases, ask somebody for help. Borrow some clothes, you know, talk to the Lord about it. Talk to your pastor about it. Something. But, but come on, y'all. You know, and that's for men, too. Hallelujah. We don't come to church showing donut rolls and things like that. We, we just don't, your, t your pants don't have to be that tight. And no, they don't need to be sagging, and then they don't need to be jacked up like Pee Wee Herman. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> modesty is modesty from man and female. Hallelujah. We don't need to see the men's donut rolls either, or the breastuses or anything else. I mean, Hallelujah. <laughs> It is about modest means to be beautiful because understand this, when you're standing in the mirror, you want to look and say, Lord, do people see you? What do they see first when they see me? You look in that full length mirror and you, whatever you put on, what do people see first? If they see your clothes, if they are jetted to a particular area before they can see you or the presence of God in you, then what you got on is wrong and it needs to be adjusted. Amen. Because if not, you're going to offend somebody and or to give somebody a reason from the outside to talk about the church. And that's not necessary. It's not what we do. Excuse me. We've got to do what we do with a spirit of excellence. I always tell people, you know, God says that we are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen generation. We are a peculiar people. We can be all of those things and dress royal. I believe that when you come to church, that you ought to dress your best. Now, that's not saying you can't have casual days. I do have them, Pastor. <laughs> I do have them. <laughs> Blue jean skirts and all. <laughs> yes, I do, and I enjoy them. But I enjoy the, even my jean skirts with style. Why? Because, well, I happen to be somebody who's a little jazzy. I just, I like a lot of detail. I like detail. Amen. But even if, even if you don't like a lot of detail, it's okay. You know, dress according to who you are, but do it in a beauty. Understand, beauty is from the inside out. It's not the outside in. Just like holiness. It's not in the outside. I wear these things, so therefore I'm holy because I'm like this. You can be all these things, long skirt, cotton pantyhose, and still be mean as the devil and full of dead men's bones. <sighs> Hallelujah. Means nothing. Holiness is from the inside out, and it's about the cleanliness of this heart. It's about the motives. What drives you to praise God? What drives you to come to service? What is your desire? Where are you, where are you focusing on? What is, what is your real reason and purpose for coming to church? If it is to please God, to praise God, to worship God, to honor God, then you know what? All of that's going to show. But if it's for anything else, don't think that that's not going to show too. Because who you are does show on the outside. Hallelujah. And then we get mad if somebody treat us funny. I used to have an old bishop. He was rough. He said, if you come to church dressed like a whore, he said, I'm going to treat you like a whore. I said, ooh, that's kind of rough. But, and it was rough. But he made his point. 
And there were some people who were really doing it. And he was rugged with it, but it changed. You know, and if you jiggle, my old bishop used to teach us that. He used to, I was 12 years old, ushering. He made the ushers wear girdles. I was 12, I had to wear a girdle. I had nothing that shook. He still made me wear a girdle. <laughs> he, said, he said, when you are ushering up and down that aisle, nothing should be shaking and waving at people. <laughs> Nothing. So he said, tie that stuff down. <laughs> so if you wiggle and you wave when you walk, invest in a girdle. It won't hurt you. Get a girdle. <laughs> Get a girdle. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I'm meddling a little bit, but I'm trying to help you. Amen. It's just, it's just these are, are modest things for, once again to not bring offense. And actually, for the women, if you wear a girdle and it's all waving, if you wear that girdle long enough, it'll help tighten everything up. That's a key for you. little help of tip for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Do what you do in excellence for God. Remember who you're working for. Remember who you belong to and whose you are. And whenever in doubt, then go back to God and talk to him. Amen. Make sure your attitudes are right. Amen. Present all things honest in the sight of God and deal with each other in love. If you're not dealing with each other in love, you're going to have problems and issues. And it shouldn't be. If there are conflicts, especially between team leaders and leaders in themselves, if there are conflicts, there shouldn't be anything that should be unresolved. You should be able to talk to each other in love and understand that you are not always going to agree with each other and that's okay. Okay. But while you don't always agree, you should not be disagreeable. You can disagree and still not be disagreeable. Amen? And you've got to hear God. And if you're both hearing God, one may have one idea, one may have another. A lot of times it's not that one is right and one is wrong. Many times with the different functions, God will give you different things because that pertains to what you're working on and this pertains to what they're working on. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Because part of the problem is you want to take what God gave you for your auxiliary and you want to put it on somebody else. Well, God told me to do this. You should be doing this too. And you should be doing this too. No, stay in your lane. Do what you do. Work with what God's given you. God didn't tell you to order everybody else around and rule everything. That's pastor's job, not yours. Amen. On praise and worship team, we have a lot of that with the praise and worship teams across the country. Everybody on the team. There's five on the team and all of them think they're ahead. And all of them are trying to rule each other. Uh, sister so-and-so need to be doing this. If some new person come on the team, you got two of the other members jumping them, talking about, well, I'm the head of this team and you're going to do it this way. No, you're not. Understand your place and work together. And if there's an issue, then you need to get to pastor and allow him to help you work it out. But you shouldn't be jumping people. There shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Because there's so many things that you run into that happen on teams. And so it is, that's why it's key to pray together pray together because as you pray together God brings love and unity between you and there won't be the isms and schisms you know what I'm saying and God will bring wherever the issues are God will bring them together everybody on teams even in the different teams that they're at you're all different there's no two alike you're all different different characters different mindsets different backgrounds um, God's raised you up in from different places you got to understand that Respect each other's anointing. I can't say that enough. Respect each other's anointing. Respect the God that is in everybody because all of you are important. Respect that. Work with each other. Love each other and allow God to flow. Amen. I pray I've been a blessing to you. God bless you. Was that good? Did you learn something? Amen. <clears throat> she wasn't that long now, was she? <laughs> I, before she came up, I leaned over to her. I said, honey, I believe in your ministry, and I know you got plenty to say. You see, because what happens is when you spend time in the presence of the Lord and you worship and you spend time with God and you learn from God, you got a lot to say because your God is highly intelligent and your God will, is able to download massive amount of information and give you tremendous understandings. Can you say amen to that? All right, let's go to our Bibles right now. Let's look at something together. We're going to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians together, and we want to look at some things in understanding. 
First Corinthians uh, chapter 11, and uh, I'm not going to, <clears throat> I'm going to make a shift on some of this. Um, verse 1, verse 1, I did feel of the Lord that we needed to have a chance for a question and answer session, Pastor, if that's okay. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and I wanted to just lay something down that is imperative to all leaders. First mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, the Amplified says, or excuse me, the King James says, Be ye followers of me as I am also of Christ. But I want you to also hear this from the Amplified version of the Bible. It says, Pattern yourselves after me. Follow my example. Listen to this. As I imitate and follow Christ. So when it says, Be ye followers of me as I follow Christ, it's breaking up that word follow that what a leader does is to have people pattern themselves after them while they personally imitate Jesus. Okay, now you're gonna need to write this down. The highest form of worship, I'm gonna repeat it again, the highest form of worship is imitation. That's the highest form of worship. The highest form of worship is imitation. So when you truly are a worshiper, you live with God, you worship him through imitating him, which means you take on his character and his nature. You become more like him. Now anyone who's leading and has no one following, you're just merely taking a walk. When you lead, people will follow but they must also have something to follow. Mm -hmm. They must have something to pattern themselves afterwards. I'll never forget I was in a service some years ago and uh, we, we all have our battles as leaders. You say, do you have your battles as a leader? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I got flesh just like you got flesh. And there's times I don't wanna do something. Y'all can sit at me and look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. There's times I don't want to do something. I don't feel like doing it. I don't want to do it. My flesh doesn't want to do it. And I went to this particular church. I didn't want to go to this particular church. The, they, the, this bishop had asked me to come and deal with his young people. I didn't want to go. And i tell you why I didn't want to go. Because I already knew by the spirit I was going to be swatting demons like you swat a, bump, a group of mosquitoes. There was so much demonic activity in that church. I didn't feel like going in there and deal with all that. Y'all happy up in there? Y'all have a good time. I don't have to be a part of that. <laughs> My name is Bennett, and I ain't in it. <laughs> Lord spoke to me and said, in fact, I want, I want to tell you as a leader, I spoke to the Lord. I said this to the Lord. Never did that again, but I said this to the Lord. <laughs> I ain't going to that church. Now, the Lord didn't say anything to me for about six months. Six months, he never said, I mean, he spoke to me with other things, but on that subject, he didn't say anything to me. And one day he came to me, he said, I want to explain something to you. You are my servant, and I am not yours. Don't you ever tell me again where you're not going, because you're going. Amen. See, as a leader, you got to understand something. You're his servant. You don't tell him what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. That's very dangerous living. Say amen. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and what I was concerned about, Bishop, yeah, it was going on. When I got there, Lord have mercy. It was so strong that the Lord actually showed me this being that was on top of the church, sitting on a throne and a scepter and a crown and a robe. Beautiful being. I, and the Lord said, do you know who this is? I, a cloud underneath his throne. I said, is that you? I mean, it was so beautiful. He said, no, that's, this is not me. I said, well, I don't know. Who is this? He said, it's the spirit of unforgiveness. It rules this church. I said, well, why is it so beautiful? He said, because they have willingly empowered it. They don't want it to go. It sits on the throne and sits on the top of this church. See, that's why I didn't want to go. <laughs> I was looking at God. This is why I didn't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> now watch this in order to break the hold of the spirit the Lord was going to have to let me become offended 
and then I'd have to choose whether to forgive or not to forgive. So you know what happened? Largest night of the service. The place is packed to capacity. I'm soon getting ready up to get up to speak. And all of a sudden, another preacher walks out. Now I was, I was dealing with another church and they, their particular churches, they used robes. This preacher walks out in a robe. And everyone starts looking at me. And this one friend of mine says, you know what? I, I think he's going to be preaching tonight. <clears throat> and I'm like going, Lord, see why I didn't want to be here? Do you see? Sure enough, they didn't even acknowledge my presence. They just simply announced him up to preach. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I've allowed this to happen to you because you must be offended in order to forgive to break the hold of the spirit. And he said, now, this man's going to be preaching the word, and the word is me, so if you don't support him preaching, you're not supporting me. Because when they announced him up to preach, I am not exaggerating. When I tell you, people in the congregation got up and went like this. <laughs> looking at my face, because they wanted to see how I was responding. Leaders, God will purposely let things happen to you, to offend you, and to hurt you to try your spirit and to give others something to pattern after. All quiet up in here. Don't worry about it. I'm used to, I'm used to preaching in libraries. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> pattern yourself after me while I imitate Jesus, while I act like him, while I forgive like him. Now you you, you got to catch this, leaders, because what will happen... Let me see the hands of you that are married here. All the hands of you that are married. Okay, all right. Now, there's an added dimension that comes to leadership when you're married. If you're not careful, you will come to church and sing Amazing Grace, but at home you've been singing the Battle Hymn Republic. You've been in war with your spouse, and then you try to come to church and try to come into some semblance with God and with the worship of God. Now, a leader must start practicing the things of God at home. Now look at Ephesians chapter six so you see what I'm talking about. When the devil really wants to tear down your leadership, what he'll do is he'll go after your home life. He'll go after your relationship, he'll go after your children, and he will go after the situation with your marriage. I'm in Ephesians chapter six, I'm dealing in verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Hmm? Uh, while I'm talking, uh, maybe someone, uh, sound people or someone can help me, I'm going to need another chair and another mic for my wife also to come in a moment. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer session. So I'll give you a chance to set that up, please. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I want to give a very key thing to leadership here. For we wrestle not against what? Now, flesh and blood. Now, he lists five things that we wrestle, do we do wrestle against. We wrestle against principalities. We wrestle against powers. We wrestle against the rulers of darkness of this world. And we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. Right? Or four things. Uh, he said, now, wherefore, excuse me, wherefore take unto thee the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, back up. I, I'm going to just go through this very quickly. Paul's telling us the arenas which we wrestle in. First arena, principalities. Principality, the first word prince, speaks of a first ruler or first in line to rule. Principalities normally refer to spirits that are over cities. Okay, so principalities. Now, can I be honest with you? What's happening to most of us as leaders you haven't even come close to challenging the principality of your spirit, of, of the, your city. Mm -hmm. These are normally spiritual generals that rule over cities. In fact, most of us don't even know what spirit rules our city. So sometimes what you have to do is start small. What, what spirit's ruling your house? <laughs> what spirit's ruling your neighborhood? What spirit's ruling your school? What spirit's ruling your job? Some of you, the reason why you're having such trouble, 
you keep encountering the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel. Let me explain that very quickly with Jezebel. Jezebel works on a few things. Intimidation, manipulation, and domination. Now be careful, I, just, I didn't just explain you. Because if you're operating in that spirit, I just explained you. And that's Jezebel. And Jezebel doesn't just move on a woman. It also can be found on a man. Hmm? So you're always trying to control things, feelings. You're always trying to control things one way or the other. Intimidation, manipulation, domination. It's the spirit of witchcraft. And some of you keep encountering that in your job, where there's someone who's always trying to manipulate, always trying to get you in trouble, always trying to get you fired. It's only the spirit of Jezebel. Hmm? So many times it's not directly the boss, but someone who has the boss's ear or in great influence with on the job. All right? That's the spirit of Jezebel. Say amen. All right, so principalities. Now, I will tell you this. Jezebel normally doesn't rule over a city, although she can be found in different places. Jezebel normally rules over a nation. So principalities, powers. Powers are normally that which rules over states. rules over a state. What, what spirit is over your state? The state of Arizona. What spirit rules here? What spirit is ruling over Phoenix and over Mesa? What, what's, what's the spirit here that's ruling? Mm -hmm. So principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. That's normally spirits that rule over a nation. And then spiritual wickedness in high places. That's normally a spirit that's ruling over nations. Hmm? All right. So you have to know those. You, these are things that we begin to know by God. Now, what a leader must learn to do, especially starting at home uh, with their spouse, with their children, they must start learning to ask God to teach them how to fight spiritual forces. Even if you're single, you're at home, you're dealing with your parents, or even if you're living by yourself, you must start learning how to fight spiritual forces. You must be so sensitive, even if you're living by yourself, that if a spirit comes into your home of depression, of loneliness, that you are sensitive enough to recognize that spirit for what it is. Now, can I tell you this? Sometimes we help that spirit. Because you go watch a sad movie. And then wonder why you're feeling lonely and sad. Da da. <laughs> okay, sometimes we help that spirit. We eat too much chocolate. You know, give me a break, break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Well, you done broke off 10 pieces. <laughs> and the sugar took you up, and now sugar is a depressant, it brings you down, and now you're wondering why you're feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to learn to fight spiritual forces within your home. God has to teach us this. It's very easy, especially when you're upset with your spouse. It's very easy to see your spouse. Very easy. You did this to me. It's very easy. Or to see it with your children or to see it with your parents. It's very easy to see the face of the person and not the spirit that's moving on the person. What a leader must learn to do is fight the spiritual force that's in the house. Mm -hmm. Let me see the hands of all the husbands in the house. All right. Now, a true husband, when they're moving in vain with God, they are the priest of their house. Now, what this actually means to God to be the priest of your house, it means you're actually meant to be the you're meant to be the keeper of the door. The Bible talks about the elders at the gate. Job was one of the elders at the gate. It means they were keepers at the gate. It means decisions were made at the gate. They would actually have a council that sat down near the gate and decisions were made at the gate. It means that when you're the husband, you're the keeper of the gate of the house. It means anything that's coming through this door passes by me. Any spirit that's trying to come into this house has to pass by me. And there's certain things, if you're sensitive enough, you already know what spirits are trying to come upon your children. Now, my mother, my father wasn't saved, so my mother became the gatekeeper. I'll never forget this. 
One time as I was a teenager, my mother began to call me in. She, she had a Christian bookstore. She had opened up a Christian bookstore, very small ministry she had. She was pastoring at the time, very small ministry. She had a radio broadcast ministry. It was only four of us. I was in high school, so it was only three working. She had a Christian bookstore, radio broadcast ministry. I mean, God, she was a woman with a gift of faith. She called me in one time, and there was another, another sister there I also knew. She said, come in. She locked the door. She said, we need to pray. She began to lay hands on me and began to rebuke the spirit of lust. And at first I was like, whoa, what is this? What is this? You know, I was like, it felt like it was an exorcism or something. What is, you know, what is this? Oh, my God. You know, have I really been that bad? Have I been doing something? I mean, what? You know, and she, I mean, these two sisters started praying. My mother and this other sister, they started praying. They were not playing. I mean, travail was going on. They were not playing. They took, they, she, you will not have my son. You will not take authority over him. You will not cause him to go into fornication. And I mean, she was going the whole nine yards. When she got done praying and breaking this, then she began to tell me, she said, the Lord showed me this spirit stalking you and coming after you and having in, starting to have influence on you. She was the gatekeeper, you understand? She was the gatekeeper. She understood. She knew the spirit before I knew the spirit. And she stepped in between the spirit and me. Hallelujah. You want to start talking about leadership? Let's talk leadership. That's leadership. When a mother and a father can recognize the spirit that's tracking their children. That's tracking their spouse and step in between. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And start taking authority over. Sometimes what you got to do, mother, sometimes you got to do father, get the oil. Let me see parents that have children in here. Let me see those that have children. Yeah. What you got to do, you got to get some oil. Go charging right into your child's bedroom. Start anointing posters and pillows and... Mom, why is everything so greasy in here? Oh. <laughs> Mom was just having a prayer meeting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When, you, when, when you're a leader, you start seeing things before they come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, if I stood up in this chair... I would see higher than what you're seeing, right? That's what would make me the chairman. <laughs> Y'all be all right. Y'all be all right. So, <clears throat> leadership sees. Look at St. John chapter 16. Uh, I tell you what you do, ushers. Why don't you go ahead and just get me another chair also, and the two of us will just sit down, and we'll move this out of the way afterwards, all right? We're going to get ready to switch in just a few moments. Thank you for your help. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. Right, keep that chair. I just want you to bring down another chair. And we'll end up moving this one after. And the two of us will just sit in the chair and answer questions. Thank you. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. All right. I want to talk to you about some, the power really within leadership. The power of leadership is you must learn to imitate your God and you must learn to start fighting spiritual forces. You must ask God to teach you to fight spiritual forces and not fight people. Now, I know this is a lesson. We talk about it all the time. We hear it in church. How many have heard that all, in church? A lot. Heard it a lot in church. Come on, let me see your hands. You've heard it a lot. Unfortunately, even though we hear it a lot, very few of us do it. You've got to start praying that God teaches you to fight. You've got to start praying that God teaches you to fight spiritual forces. Sometimes you will actually see a spirit try to come on your spouse. And if you're not careful, you start just arguing with your spouse, ignoring the spiritual influence. Sometimes it seems like your spouse is being drawn away from you. They seem to be more captivated with another person or captivated with something else. Many times all you're dealing with is with a spiritual force. And what you got to start doing, in fact, uh, okay, I'll, I'll use the scripture, then I'll, I'll move on in just a moment. I, I just want to, I want the last portion of the scripture, St. John 16, 13, the Bible says uh, that the spirit of truth, he will guide you into what? Everyone shout all truth. The Holy Ghost is meant to guide you into all truth, not push, pull, drag you. Not some truth, not just spiritual truth. The Holy Ghost guides you into all truth. The Holy Ghost will also guide you into natural truth. Things that are truth in the natural. The Holy Ghost will guide you there. That's why the Holy Ghost can teach you how to cook.
Holy Ghost can teach you how to dress. Uh, my sisters used to make fun of me when I was growing up. Boy, you dress like a clown. <laughs> you's a mess. God going to have to do something with you. I didn't really care, personally. I didn't really care. You know, if it didn't match, it was on. <laughs> if it wasn't wrinkled, it was covering something. It's all, that's all that mattered to me. Worked for me. What's your problem? Well, you look like a mess. Don't look. <laughs> you know us with our attitudes and our rubber band neck. Whatever. <laughs> uh, that, that was me. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know nothing about that. that. That was me. The Lord started dealing with me. You represent me. And I'm, I'm not McDonald's. So you looking like a clown don't work. I'm a king. And I'm not just a king. I'm a king of kings. So you got to represent me. You got to start looking more like me. You got to dress for me. Not, that's why some of you have problems. You dress for you. You wear your style. You, like, you dress what you like. You dress for him. Question, when you get to heaven, by the grace of God, <laughs> isn't it by his grace? Amen. When we all get to heaven by the grace of God, <laughs> you thought I was indicting you. See, see, mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> are you going to decide what you wear for all of eternity? Will you pick one outfit in eternity? One. Or does God decide what you wear for all of eternity? God decides. So why are you deciding now? When well, you're supposed to be preparing to go to eternity. How many parents in here that have had little kids? You may presently have them, two years old, three years old. Good. Does your little two-year-old decide what they wear? Who decides that? Oh, you decide that. You dress them in what you want them in. And that's called good parenting. And then your children, when they get eight and nine, see the, what you dress them. Mom, you put me in that! Burn this picture. You go, oh, no, baby, this is good blackmail right here. Act up. I'm going to show this to your friends. You better clean your room. <laughs> That's good parenting. That You decided what they wore. Huh. How come it's good parenting when you do it, but when God does it, it's legalism? He's the ultimate parent. And what you do is you train a child on how to dress. You even, once you give them living liberty to dress, you, if you're a good parent, you tell them you have to pass by me. And if I don't like what you're wearing, you're taking it off. Well, then what's the big deal with you learning from God how to dress and then him, you passing by him? And if he don't like it, you're taking it off. That's good parenting. Why are you acting like that's legalism? Some of you attack just like teenagers with God. You always want to spoil my fun. You always want to tell me what to wear and what to do. <laughs> Can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> and that's the way you act with God. <laughs> okay, I tickled myself. Never mind. All right, so uh, look what he said at the end of this. Look at what he said at the end of St. John 16, 13. And he says, and the Holy Ghost is going to show you things to come. Everybody say things to come. A good leader steps into this realm with God, whereby God can actually show you things that have not yet transpired. He will actually show you things to come. He will actually show you spiritual forces before they hit. He'll show you spirits that are trying to come into your home. He'll show you spirits that are trying to attack you. He'll show you spirits that are trying to attack your, your house or your wife or your children. He'll show you spirits that are trying to enter in. He'll show you generational curses. Spirits that are already in your lineage that are literally coming as if it were through your DNA. And show you how to break them. Say amen. So what a true leader does, and I guess, let me, let me get to this too. Isaiah 58 and 6. Let me just show you this. Isaiah 58 and 6. Let's get to this. Um, so what do I do when I see these spiritual forces? What do I do? That's why leaders need to fast. Leaders should fast. You should be people that fast. 
Huh? Amen. Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? Four things that fasting is meant to do. When you fast, you need to claim these four things. To loose the band of wickedness, undo the heavy burden, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. You should be claiming those four things when you fast. Sometimes God will set you on a fast for a member of your house or set you on a fast for yourself, and you should be claiming these four things, that God performs these four things. Sometimes God will send that for, your, for the ministry. You should be also claiming these four things, that God will perform them when you fast. Amen? Sometimes you've got to do it for yourself. Uh, you've got to learn to talk to yourself. You say, well, I thought that was being crazy. Well, really, when it turns crazy is when you start answering yourself. Okay, I'm back. So, <laughs> you know you do. Man, what I do with the, those keys? Oh yeah, I left them on the couch. Okay, <laughs> woo, 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 bring it down, woo. <laughs> you start having conversations with yourself, okay, we got a problem. Um, the thing is this, there are times, David said he talked to himself. Psalm 42, verse five, David spoke to himself. Psalm 42, verse five, why art thou cast down, O oh, my? soul. He's talking to himself. Why art thou disquieted in me? Now watch this, watch this. Why you must, how you must learn to talk to yourself is not asking yourself questions as if you have the answers. You must learn to talk to yourself in order to bring yourself in alignment with God. Hope thou in God, for I will yet praise him. Did you see what he's doing? He said, you're depressed. Here's the antidote. Praise. God gives you the garment of praise, Isaiah 61, verse 3. Isaiah 61, verse 3. God gives us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So you're depressed. He's speaking to himself. Here's your answer, self. Start to praise. Hallelujah. I've had to do this with myself. I've had to grab myself by the flesh, by the collar, and say, you're just a little bit out of control, buddy. Call him for a fast. Time to get down. See, that's what a good leader does. A good leader first moves to harness themselves by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Spirit and by the Word of God. A good leader acknowledges when they're not having proper moods and proper attitudes, and a good leader goes after it with passion and aggression, does not tolerate it. Here's what my motto has become developed with God. Now, the Lord never told me this, but see, when you get to know him, you get to understand certain things. I remember in prayer one day, I told the Lord this. I don't ever, ever want you to have to speak to me twice, ever. You speak to me once, and I obey. Do you understand that's how God really operates? God spoke to the sun once to stay up in glory, and it's been there. God spoke to light once to come forth, and it's been shining ever since. God speaks to the angels once and they move. It's us he has to keep speaking to five and six and seven and eight and nine, ten times. I only want you to speak to me once. I want to be so obedient, so submissive that when you speak once, it's done. I don't want a finger in opposition to you. I want to lay down and stay down. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, help me to lay down and stay down. And say, help me to do it with joy. <laughs> that, that's the power of leadership. A true leader controls themselves. Now let me just get to this so that we can have a time for question and answer sessions. Let's go to the book of St. John chapter 8. St. John chapter 8. And we're going to start looking at verse uh, 47. Excuse me, not 47, sorry, 37. 37. God speaking to Israel. He, Jesus is speaking to the religious rulers. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Did you hear that? Did you hear the contradiction? You're Abraham's seed, but the deeds that you're doing are not of Abraham. Verse 38, he's going to make the explanation clear. He said, now here's the problem. I speak that which I've seen with my father. You speak that which you've seen of your father. He said, here's the problem. We have two different fathers. We have the same seed, two different fathers. 
You say, what are you trying to say? Simple. He was telling the religious rulers, you have switched fathers. He goes to verse 43. If you go to verse actually 40, 43, in the same chapter, 43, he starts getting into it in, in clarity and understanding with them. I'm still in chapter 8. I'm in verse 43. Listen to what he says. Now, you, you, can't, you can't understand my speech because you can't hear my words. But 44, he said, ye are your father, the who? He's talking to, the, he's talking to the, the teachers of the word of the Lord. He's not talking to people in the world. He's talking to the leaders. He said, ye of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And when he lies, he tells the lie of himself. Why? Because he's not just a liar, but he's the father of lies. He's the originator of lies. So what leaders have to be careful of is, who's your daddy? Who are you imitating? If you don't lift your hands in worship, hmm, who does that act like? Is that what God does? Or is that what Satan does? Satan doesn't worship God either. Satan doesn't lift his hands and praise God either. Who's your daddy? Ask the person beside you, who's your daddy? You keep coming in the presence of God looking like you've been baptized in lemon juice? Who's your daddy? You need a 10-foot ladder to scratch the belly of a snake? Who's your daddy? You're acting lower than a pregnant aunt? Who's your daddy? You can play handball with the curve with your bottom lip? Who's your daddy? Who are you imitating? And by the way, whoever you're imitating is who you're worshiping. What some of you leaders don't understand is because you feel justified because you feel hurt and you don't realize that you're actually worshiping Satan. Because you act just like him. You don't worship God like him. You sit there all scowled face like him. You act like a mule that just got finished chewing on briars. You act just like the devil in the presence of the Lord. Because Psalm 16 verse 11 says, in his presence is fullness of joy. But can I quote the first part of that verse? We like quoting that part, but we miss the first part of the verse. Psalm 16 verse 11. Thou will show me the pathways of life. For in his presence is fullness of joy. Joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore you can't have the fullness of joy without him showing you the pathway of life when he shows you the pathway of life you get the joy from walking in the path hallelujah hallelujah you get the joy by obeying him by acting like him by imitating him who do you touch the person beside you say who do you imitate who do you imitate who do you act like who is it that you dress like? Because the devil likes to flaunt and show his stuff off too. Who do you act like? Hallelujah. Somebody say, I imitate Jesus. See, that's the highest form of worship is imitation. That's why I lift my hands. That's why I open up my mouth. That's why I read my Bible. That's why I bring my Bible to church. That's why I refuse to have a bad attitude. You hear me? I refuse. I will only worship one God. Satan is the one with the bad attitude. Satan is the one that's nasty. Satan is the one that's irritable. I refuse. Now you understand the psalmist. Psalm 34, verse 1. Psalm 34, verse 1. Now you understand the psalmist. Psalm 34, verse 1. Listen to what he said. I will bless the Lord. I didn't say I felt like it. I didn't say I was in the mood. I said I will. I command myself to bless the Lord. Not sometimes, but at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Don't tell me you praise him and don't open up your mouth. The devil is a liar. Because if you praise him, it's continually in your mouth. Somebody open up your mouth and praise him in this house. Act like your daddy. Glory, glory. Come on, lift your hands a moment. I feel something just beginning to stir and shake and move. Help me just move out this out the way these two things. Thank you. Come on, lift your hands to him and glorify him a moment. Stand on your feet a moment and just glorify him. Give him the glory. Give him the honor. Thank you, sir. 
That's right, that's right. That's it, that's it. Oh, you need to glorify him because he's God. If you're a leader, you must always check who you're imitating. Now, some of you have been very wounded, been very wounded by a husband, wounded by a wife, wounded by children, wounded by parents. Some of you are very wounded, wounded by leadership. And the problem is you've allowed that door, you've allowed the wound to open up a door that has allowed the enemy to enter. And that makes you feel justified and feel right for acting in an ungodly manner. If you're not careful, your wounds will cause you not to come to church anymore. And make you feel right for staying away because no one loves me anyhow. No one really wants me there. They just tolerate me. So what am I coming for? If you're not careful, your hurts and particularly your wounds will justify you to make you say ungodly things. So you actually start speaking the words of Satan. He speaks words of hate. And you will actually tell people, I hate you. That's not God. You're changing fathers. A leader must always imitate God, not imitate the devil. There's only two choices here, not a whole lot of choices. You only got two choices. Either you're imitating God or you're imitating Satan. That's it. And when you're always into my will, I want this, I want that, I want this, you're imitating the devil because he's the originator of the five I wills. So when it's always, I do it my way, check your daddy because that's not the way Jesus does it. Jesus said, not my will. He's the very opposite. Amen. Come on and lift your hands and worship him one more time in this house. Baby, come have a seat.